In this lecture, we will continue our discussion on the design stage. Specifically, we're going to be looking at privacy enhancing technologies or privacy preserving technologies or techniques. We'll look at the different terms in just a moment. And so in this lecture, we're going to focus first on some terminology that you need to know for the exam. And then we're going to focus on four privacy enhancing technologies. Those are homomorphic encryption, secure multi-party computation, federated learning, and differential privacy. There are a few terms that you need to know for the exam that are in addition to the privacy enhancing technologies we're about to look at. Pseudonymization is where we have a personal identifier, such as a name, and we change that name from something like Kyle David to something very generic like Joe Smith. De-identification is where we go through a data set and we remove some, but perhaps not all, of the personal identifiers. Anonymization is where we remove all personal identifiers with data obfuscation or data masking. This is where we are modifying sensitive data so that, it, so that it has little or no value to unauthorized users. Finally, data minimization. This is something that we've talked a bit about already. This is where we are collecting only the data that's necessary for the particular business function. And so all five of these, these are different privacy preserving techniques. We can pseudonymize a data set, de-identify it, anonymize it, et cetera, et cetera, and, and do all of that to help preserve or protect privacy. Now, when it comes to privacy enhancing technologies, there are four that you need to know about for the AIGP exam. Before we get to those, just a quick note, depending on where you're reading online, you may see privacy enhancing technologies, privacy enhancing techniques, and privacy preserving technologies and techniques all used synonymously. You don't need to know the fine grained difference between these right now. I just wanted to point that out that as you're looking through materials, you may see some of these phrases used interchangeably. Before we look at homomorphic encryption, I just want to lay out at the start for folks that perhaps don't know what encryption is, what encryption is. So what is encryption and how does it work? Well, the top line takeaway here is that encryption is a mathematical process to encode data, to secure data. And I have this diagram at the bottom. I want you to think about it this way. We have an individual on the left here. They have an email that they want to send their buddy. But if they send that email over the internet without it being encrypted, then anyone can intercept that email and read the email. And so what we do in order to preserve the confidentiality and the integrity of this message is we are going to encrypt it. And so the sender has a key. They are going to use that key to essentially scramble the data. So anyone who intercepts the message on its way to the receiver, if they open up that message and they do not have the key to decrypt the data, then they're just going to see a bunch of gibberish. So we have this person here on the left. They are going to encrypt their data using a key. They're going to send their email over the internet, and then the receiver on the other end already has the key needed in order to decrypt the message, and they can read it that way. So the process of encryption requires keys. The sender has a key, the receiver has a key, and ensuring that those keys get to the right person and get there safely and are not also intercepted and copied by malicious actors that is a whole nother topic that you don't need to know anything about here. I just wanted to lay out, before we get to homomorphic encryption, at a very basic high level, what encryption is. And that's it. It's a mathematical process to encode or to encrypt data. We have a sender's key, we have a receiver's key, and that helps us to encrypt and decrypt the data. With that, what is homomorphic encryption? And instead of going into all of the details regarding what these technologies are and how they work, I thought it would be best, actually, from a non-technical perspective, to consider what is the problem? 
right? What is the problem that homomorphic encryption or secure multi-party computation or differential privacy or federated learning, what are the problems that these privacy enhancing technologies solve? And in knowing what the problem is, providing a solution so that you see how these technologies work at a high level. And you don't need to know the details for the AIGP exam, okay? Remember, 10 miles wide, one inch deep. You just need to know what's the problem, what's the solution. So the problem that encryption poses, you'll remember based on our example just a moment ago, right? I have a key, you have a key, I have a message, I encrypt it, I send it to you, you have a key, you decrypt it, all right? Well, before I send it to you, and once you open it, that data is exposed. And that's a problem if I want to put data somewhere for you to train on it. That data is going to be exposed for some time in order for the model to train. And so that's the problem. The data is exposed for some time so that the model can train. The solution that homomorphic encryption provides is that it enables encrypted computations and training. So that data is never exposed. I can put all of my data in a, in a data warehouse, on a server, whatever, and using homomorphic encryption, the model can train on the data and that data can remain encrypted. So the data is never exposed. Right now, this is not a great technology for data at scale. And so if you're asked on the exam to choose from, you know, let's just say that it's the four privacy enhancing technologies we're talking about now. If you're asked to choose which one of these is most feasible, it is not going to be homomorphic encryption. The second privacy enhancing technology that you need to know for the exam is secure multi-party computation. The problem that this solves is that organizations want to leverage aggregated data but cannot share. And so again, I want you to think about the three individuals on the left-hand side here. They each have their own data, but for whatever reason, they cannot share that data. Maybe there are legal reasons. And so what secure multi-party computation allows is for organizations to compute on combined data without revealing any information about the input data. We have our, our three servers over here on the, the, the left-hand side. They are with each of these individuals. And what secure multi-computation does is it takes each of these data sets, and in this example, we're just chopping them up into thirds, so it puts a third of the yellow here, a third of the yellow there, and the, the other third of the data here. Same thing with the orange and with the blue. And then the models over here, these little, these art figure guys, they are able to train on the combined data and then they re-aggregate themselves on the other end, okay? How exactly is this happening? Well, apparently requires a very sophisticated understanding of advanced statistics. And you're not gonna get that from me because you don't need it from the exam. All you need to know is that secure multi-party computation allows organizations to compute on combined data without revealing any information about the input data. Federated learning is a much easier concept to understand. The problem that federated learning solves is that aggregating data from multiple parties it increases liability and risk. If you imagine taking all of the data on 100 million American cell phones and putting that all on one server, one massive server, or putting it all in one data center, and then training a model on that, that creates a single point of failure if that data were to be breached. Instead, what federated learning does is it allows parties to train a shared model without aggregating the data. What happens here, and I want you to think about this, this diagram here on the right-hand side, we have our model here in the middle. This is called the global model. What happens here is we have a global model in the middle, and this global model sends a model to each of these edge devices, or it could be a server, 
The model will go to the device, will train on the device, and then send that learning back to the global model and the global model updates. And so there's no data, there's no private data that is moving from the end user here, again, whether this is a smartphone or a PC, a laptop, a server, whatever, there is no private data that is being aggregated in one single place. Instead, the model is being trained on that device. That model is sending its updated weights to the global model here, and that global model will reflect the updates from each of the devices that it trains on. And so data is neither collected nor stored in one location. The final privacy enhancing technology that you need to know about is differential privacy. The problem that differential privacy solves is that reverse engineering data outputs can re-identify individual data. And so I, I have your outputs, and if I have enough of them, I can use that data to re-identify someone in the data set. The solution provided by differential privacy is that it adds noise to the data. And that noise is a sliding scale of privacy and accuracy. And so imagine these different gauges at the, at the very bottom here. Starting with the, the left-hand side, we have less privacy but more utility in the data. In the middle, I have some privacy and some utility. And then if I crank it all the way to the right-hand side, I have more privacy but less utility. And so this is a trade-off right now that AI engineers and privacy professionals are grappling with. Do we want accurate data, but little or no privacy? Or do we want something in the middle? Do we want maximum privacy? And are we able to deal with less accuracy as a result? So again, differential privacy, remember the introduction of noise, sliding scale, trade-off between privacy and utility slash accuracy. In this lecture, we went over privacy enhancing technologies and privacy preserving techniques. Terminology that you need to remember for the exam includes pseudonymization, de-identification, anonymization, data obfuscation or masking, and data minimization. Remember that homomorphic encryption enables encrypted computations and training. This is not feasible at scale. Secure multi-party computation allows organizations to compute on combined data without revealing any information about input data. Federated learning is where parties train a shared ML model without aggregating data. Model trains on edge devices or servers. An example of an edge device is a smartphone or laptop or server. This is an end user device. Once that model has trained on the edge device, its updates are sent to a single global model. And under federated learning, data is neither collected nor stored in one location. And finally, with differential privacy, noise is added to the data Again, think of a sliding scale of privacy and accuracy. More privacy, less accuracy. More accuracy, less privacy.